I will resist you with my last ounce of strength. Strength is irrelevant. Resistance is futile. Your culture will adapt to service ours. Impossible. My culture is based on freedom and self-determination. Freedom is irrelevant. Self-determination is irrelevant. You must comply. We would rather die. So by now it's clear that the resistance movement is a thing. A real thing. We've been using the term here at Swing State for months, and while it's been circulating around progressive circles for a while now, others in the media are beginning to pick it up, adding steam to a growing phenomenon. There is no telling what day exactly it began, or in what location, who specifically comprises it, or who leads it. Answering the whens and whos is a tall order. Did it begin on election day, or the day after when spontaneous protests lit up city streets across the nation with their outrage over the minority president's election by technicality against the plain will of we the people? Should we credit the five million women and men both here and abroad who again humiliated the so-called president the day after his poorly attended inauguration ceremony by summoning the largest one-day protests in American history? Should we credit the throngs of people packing town halls across the country, including right here in Iowa's 3rd District, reinvigorating the process of civic participation and perhaps our democracy along with it? Maybe we credit Keith Olbermann, who immediately changed the name of his GQ web series from The Closer to The Resistance in light of Trump's election, crystallizing both the term and the zeitgeist spreading across the country. How about the Bernie Kratz? or plain old Democrats, who rush to gear up for state-level races and the long road of organization and mobilization yet to come? And what about the free press, who will not bow to President Joffrey's tantrums and juvenile demands for, quote, fairness? You know, the investigative juggernauts like the New York Times, who will actually call a lie a lie, and on the front page. You could go on passing out credit for hours. It kind of reminds me of the joke dreamt up for internet trolls and hecklers of the Women's March. What do you call a billion snowflakes? An avalanche. There's a clue in the joke, I think, and maybe even a hint of profundity. Snow doesn't become something other than snow to make an avalanche. All the little individual crystals, in their own time, gradually leave one state and enter another. The difference between potential and kinetic energy. What was once dormant, docile, or asleep is now awake and moving fast. Can you nail down the exact second a few sheets of ice and snow stop and a full-blown avalanche begins? Probably not. And at any rate, it's not the issue. The issue is what the avalanche represents for those in its path, and that is what we here at Swing State would like to contribute to the conversation this week. There is indeed an avalanche heading Trump's way, but we need to answer the question, what is the resistance for? What is this all about? It's not a historical question. For myself, the answer is very simple, but I imagine there will be disagreement. I'll take my shot at persuading the unpersuaded. I believe the resistance is defined by one major concern. The removal of Donald J. Trump from the office of presidency by any and all legal slash electoral means possible, as soon as possible. And, in the meantime, the resistance seeks to obstruct, delay, and disrupt Trump and his cronies' more sinister ambitions. Since we're playing defense, we are squarely in a take-what-we-can-get position. It doesn't matter to me if he resigns, he's impeached, run out of town on a rail, or struck by a bolt of lightning. The main objective of this movement is the removal of Trump and Trumpists, authentic ones or the craven political species, from power. Now, thoughtful people may say that an agenda based solely on what you're opposed to is built on sand, and any achievements you're likely to have are in danger of unraveling when the ethical abomination that brought about your movement in the first place disappears. They're right, in a sense. Resistance movements do have expiration dates, not unlike resistance movements to military occupation, like the various cells active in European countries during World War II. Those finding themselves in a state of resistance do not necessarily know the day or the hour when they can return to a sense of normalcy, or even if they ever will. But despite that, there remains a clear, identifiable goal around which participants coalesce, even if they differ on a number of other issues. The removal of tyranny. The French resistance did not have its mind on reconstruction or the Nuremberg trials in the summer of 1940. Then the resistance was inspired by what Jean Casso referred to as refuse absurde, absurd refusal, the refusal to accept that the Reich would win, and if it did, it would be better to resist. Things happen in order. Once the main objective is achieved, it goes beyond mere resistance into something else. Having said all this, we acknowledge that the resistance has and will continue to take on several shapes and appear in many unexpected places before the goal is reached, be it a few months or a few election cycles. Yesterday it was a march for women's rights. Tomorrow, it will be a march for scientific understanding over superstition and wish-thinking. It's rowdy town hall meetings and celebrity stunts and billboards. It's arguments on Twitter and Facebook and real journalists going to work. You will see it in local and national races and all over TV and radio. One day, hopefully soon, the resistance movement will no longer be enough. 
And here is where the left should remember its modern history. The major difference between the Tea Party movement and the Occupy Wall Street movement was one of them turned into real electoral weight, while the other dissolved into nothing. Tea Partiers carried almost 50 House seats and succeeded in a handful of senatorial bids as well. Meanwhile, Occupy never even coalesced around a unifying theme or a slate of candidates. And while occupiers are right to remind us that they changed the national discourse with the introduction of the 99 versus the 1%, that is about all they accomplished. If the resistance movement is going to achieve something more, it needs to learn from the single-mindedness of its successful forebears and beat the drum. So, keep marching. Keep arguing. Keep bugging your representatives. Keep nagging them for an independent 9-11 style commission to investigate Comrade Trump's shady ties to Russia and his curious and secretive behavior. Beat that drum. The sleep of reason brings forth monsters. I'm a whiner and I keep whining and whining until I win. Maybe somebody will rise up. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. Welcome to Swing State, an aggressive, progressive, critical and political podcast from the middle of the Midwest. Welcome back to Swing State, the weekly show about politics in the Trump era. We want to remind you, if you can't get enough of us once a week, we're also on Twitter at swingstate underscore show, Facebook, facebook.com slash swingstateshow. We have a website, swingstateshow.wordpress.com. And if you want to throw us some love notes or hate mail, send it to our email, swingstateshow at gmail.com. We'll make sure to read it. As AJ mentioned in his broadside, we're all part of the resistance. Now that takes many shapes and forms, and lately those shapes and forms have included vocal attendees these at local town hall meetings except in a lot of cases the representatives have been skipping out some of your republican colleagues senator tom cotton in arkansas bill cassidy in louisiana uh, chuck grassley in iowa held town hall meetings you did not right why not because they're not town halls anymore the problem now is and it's all in writing i'm not making this up you, what, they, what these groups really want is for me to schedule a public forum. They then organize three, four, five, six hundred liberal activists in the two counties or wherever I am in the state. They, according to the document, they take up, they get there early, they take up all the front seats, they spread themselves out, they ask questions, they all cheer when the questions are asked, they're instructed to boo no matter what answer I give. Um, then at the end, they're also told not to give up their microphone when, when they ask questions. It's all in writing. It's in this indivisible document. So you don't believe that they're, not that they're real? That well, they, these I mean, are real... real no, they're real people. They're real liberal activists. But do you not think that that process of, of engaging with the public and at least giving them the sense that you're there to listen? Not You can't believe that everyone that would attend a town hall would be some liberal activist designed to undermine you. Well, I would tell you when we're seeing around the country, it's about 80 to 90 percent because they're organized. I mean, they're, they're, an organ, they're the only group out there organizing to turn people out to these events. And again, if it was a productive engagement or conversation, that would be fine. I'd have no problem justifying my views on these issues. The problem is they're not designed to have a productive engagement. They're designed to basically heckle and scream at me in front of cameras. Do you understand why some of them are wary of holding these town halls, doing it by teleconference no, or not showing up? No I, no, I honestly don't, and I don't accept it for a minute. If you don't have the guts to face your constituents, then you shouldn't be in the United States Congress. And if you need police at the meetings, that's fine. Have police at the meetings. Have security at the meetings. But don't use that as an excuse to run away from your constituents after you support repealing the Affordable Care Act, throwing 20 million people off of health insurance, doing away with pre-existing conditions. If you're going to do all of those things, answer the questions that your constituents have. Louis Gohmert, for example has basically used public safety as a reason for why he's ducking out. Because according to him, the sergeant at arms and so forth and so on, public at risk, blah, 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 whatever. I don't buy that for shit. That is, that is the weakest of the weak sauce excuses I've ever heard. One time, somebody somewhere was shot, so I'm just going to refuse to meet with my constituents for the remainder of time. By that logic, he should never walk down a street in a major city. He should right. never leave the country, God forbid, and go anywhere else. And I think Bernie's right. I mean, if you're really worried about safety, have some fucking security. It's that simple. I mean, that's that's normally how stuff works. You have a large group of people. You want to make sure they're safe and secure. You provide security. If, if only he were in a position of political power, say, where he might be able to, I don't know, 
call for that kind of security or maybe just work it out so that a few extra bodies show up. Yeah, I mean, Sadly, there is no such position, yeah, so I guess he's just screwed. What if there were agencies dedicated to the protection of our politicians? Yeah. I mean, you know, think what that would be like. Write, write that down, Luane. We're going to come back to that at a later time, I'm sure. Look, we know why you don't want to be there, and it's because you don't like what people are having to say. I recognize that uh, a lot of politicians have latched on to the indivisible document as evidence somehow that there's an organized movement to just disrupt politicians at town hall meetings just to disrupt them. I, I don't know how to break this to them, but no, the reason they're disrupting you is because you're fucking idiots and everybody hates you. And there's a reason why. It's because you don't fucking listen. And all those things that they, they keep pointing to as evidence of some sort of some sort of uh, a plot against you, that's just a way of organizing people so they can operate the most efficiently. Yeah, they're not supposed to give up the mic because you haven't answered the question. That's why they don't want to give up the mic yet. They want to do what responsible journalists do. They want to do what the constituents want to do, which is get a straight fucking answer for once and not give up until they do. Now, the easiest and simplest straight answer is nobody likes your fucking guy. All right? Nobody likes the guy that you have in charge of your party. That's what they're pissed off about. And with good reason. But you want to know how much they don't like your guy? I'm going to tell you. So right now I'm just looking at the real clear politics, uh, the, their polling data on the presidential approval rating. Donald Trump, just to kind of to bring to bring you back to a historical context, Donald Trump is the most unpopular president at this point in the modern era of po- basically since scientific polling began and we started measuring such things like data day presidential approval. Donald Trump is the lowest rated figure of all time. He is a historic loser. Nothing like this anybody's ever seen before. It's sad. Sad. Just to kind of give you a highlight of what we're looking at. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. From the last 10 polls that are taken from a variety of organizations, uh, Rasmussen, Gallup, NBC, CBS, Reuters, etc. Five of them have him at 42 or below in approval. Currently on Real Clear Politics, his average is 43.6% approve 50.3 percent disapprove and we should mention that these stats are probably a little a little bit fudged by including uh, the conservative Rasmussen in there, which has him at a tie, uh, and it's the only one that has him even close. Uh, Quinnipiac from 216 to 221 has his approval at 38% and his disapproval at 55 That is a swing of 17 points, ladies and gentlemen. 17 points. That's nearly a fifth. Nearly a fifth of the people disapprove than approve of him at this point. And his numbers, if you're if you just look at the trend line, the highest he was ever at ever in his entire presidency was on February 4th. He was at 46% approval, 48.3% disapproval, and it has been a slow, gradual slump downward from there. A couple of hitches to bring him back up, but right now he is near a historic low where he was on January 31st, 2017, where he was at an approval rating of 43.3%. Today, he is at 43.6, and the trend appears to be going downward. So as Luane said, the problem that these congressmen and women are running into at their town halls, assuming that they go to them at all and don't come up with some ridiculous excuse, is that their policies and their figurehead are despised by the majority of Americans who incidentally did not vote for Donald Trump. Could I have you go back to something you said on February 4th? That was his highest point, and it was what again? (laughs) His highest point on February 4th was 46% approve, 48.3% disapprove. So his highest was still a net negative. Yes, at his highest... There were still more people who disapproved of him. Yeah. And within 10 days of his inauguration... He was at 43.3% approval. That notched up to its high point at 46. And then it has slowly gone back down to 43.6. If present trends continue, it will go even lower than that. Um, Just for reference, Quinnipiac uh, had him at 38% approval. Uh, CBS News has him at 39. A recent one from Gallup has him at 42 And I should also mention that there are two lines. There is the approval and the disapproval, and they're both moving. The disapproval is going up, and the approval is going down simultaneously. So the the spread is actually getting wider as we go, as undecided people make up their mind, as people who were supporting him flip away now that they're seeing that he's he's all about the Dakota Access Pipeline and and all sorts of other issues, the the, the immigrant deportation, the Muslim ban, etc. He is doing doing nothing to gain this favor back, absolutely nothing. I don't know how the trend wouldn't or couldn't be a a continued disapproval rise. I mean, I don't know how that that would be possible any other way, short of something bizarrely miraculous for him. Because the more shit he does, the more people it's going to impact. 
and it's going to impact them negatively. It doesn't even matter what the policy is. I can almost make a blanket statement that whatever his next step is, it will impact more people negatively than it will positively. Well, just take uh, just taking one example, the, one of the big pushes that he's got going on now is tax reform. Do any of you listening to us seriously think that a change in the tax code is going to come about to benefit you? Or is it going to be a cutting corporate taxes and the top marginal tax rates for the ones that he's stuffing in his cabinet and the one that he's working on their behalf to get their tax rates lower, his rich pals in New York? All you have to do is go back to, to W. The average citizen got a couple hundred bucks checked compared yeah. to the the millions saved by the upper tiers. And we did this twice, by the way, W. He cut taxes twice, once before and then once after we went to war in Iraq. <laughs> so the end result ultimately was an economy that tanked just a little bit. Every time you hear a Republican bitching about the national debt, please point them to the W. Bush administration and tell them to shut the fuck up. Yeah, because let's remember, when Bill Clinton left office, we had a surplus. Yep, about $2 trillion. And, and the national now, debt was much lower at that point. And then Bush comes along, and all of a sudden our surplus goes away. Now, I don't want to get off on too big a tangent, because, sure. I mean, W is already long gone. But th- this is the type of thing, though, because this is what W did to Texas. And all you had to do was look at what he was doing and assume it was going to scale up. The problem is, not enough people were paying attention. And that's what we ran into again with Trump. Not enough people were actually paying attention. They were listening to the bullshit coming out of his mouth which in Trump's case was about how he was going to do all these things to make America great again and all that other stuff. But nobody who heard that and believed it was looking at the shit he had done before. They weren't looking at the bankruptcies. They weren't looking at the the shady business deals. They weren't looking at the number of fucking lawsuits from people who he has not paid, all of which should have been a monstrous red flag, and it wasn't because nobody was paying attention. They literally couldn't be bothered to look into this guy even a little bit because I don't understand how anybody who's ever lost a fucking job or been screwed by their boss, which when you're looking at, say, the industrial Midwest is a lot of fucking people are going to look at him and go, yeah, I I want to vote for the guy who's exactly like the guys who fucking fired me and tanked the industry that gave me my living. Yeah, it's it's the working class people voting for the guy who got famous by saying, you're fired on TV. I mean, it's it's amazing. But to, to return to the town hall subject, since we did, we did get on a little tangent Sorry. there, but no, it's fine. To return back to the, the town hall topic, Republicans, they're in the shit now. This is why I decided to write the broadside this week on the resistance movement and trying to, to define the resistance movement and to, and to kind of pull people together to talk about what is it we're actually about here in this right. resistance movement. It's the disruption aspect. You know, I mean, yes, we we talked about the, the end goal is, you know, getting Donald Trump and his cronies out of power. Of course, that's that's the aim. But in the meantime, we are having major impact on policy. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want evidence of that, look no further than the dead look in Republicans' eyes when you talk about repealing Obamacare now. Look at the people showing up at the town hall. It, it pisses me off when people are saying that they're paid Soros protesters, but because A, a it's just a it's a it's a cop out so conservatives don't have to deal with reality. Well, you know, once again. You, you invent a fairy tale of George Soros in your closet under your bed paying somebody to, you know, scare you. That is not what's happening. There are real people. In fact, many of them are not liberals or progressives that are showing up at the town hall saying, if it weren't for Obamacare, I'd be fucking dead. Dead. They're talking about an actual impact from an actual policy decision. That's the thing we have to focus on. We have to stop worrying about the rhetoric and shit. You have to be able to point out to people, this is how this policy hurts you. This isn't just about, oh my God, Trump's an asshole. I hate him. The reason people are going to the town hall is because they're asking questions about what's going to happen to them. What happens when you're going to repeal Obamacare, which is also the ACA for those of you who are confused yet. It's the same thing. And in many cases, it's the reason you have insurance when you wouldn't have before. This is what amazes me is watching. I've, you know, I've been watching at least parts of uh, various different town halls across the country. You know, what a what an amazing age of technology and cell phones we live in. It's it's amazing to me to watch these Republican goons stutter and fuck around trying to explain how they're going to repeal the Affordable Care Act, but they're going to keep competition. They're going to keep the pre-existing condition provision. They're going to keep the staying on your parents' insurance, but they don't. They're not going to do the individual mandate, guys. That literally doesn't make 
any economic sense. I'm not a fucking economist, but I do know that without the individual mandate, you do not have the motivation for the young, healthy people to enter the system, which gives it its stability to begin with. That's the whole premise, is that young, healthy people are forced to join the ranks of the insured, which will then allow people who are much older and sicker to be able to afford the insurance because the risk is spread around in a larger pool. And the idea that you can keep items A, B, C, and D from Obamacare, but repeal the law, is absurd. And they know it's absurd. And they've known that for years. So this really just, it really gets me. Anybody who's feeling sorry for Republicans right now, I just want to kick you in the fucking nuts. Because who didn't see this coming? How stupid would you have to be to not have seen this coming? Well, I'll tell you how stupid they had to be. They had to be fucking Republican stupid. Because yeah, dumb enough to vote for Trump. Put it that way. Well, here, here's the thing. I think part of the problem is the Republicans also bought into Trump's bullshit. I think they also thought, we're going to roll in here. We're going to be the big-ass swinging dicks because we're the ones who got rid of Obama. Well, he didn't get rid of Obama. He ran out of time. That's all that amounted Obama to. Obama would have been fucking emperor for a thousand years if we didn't have the two term limits in the Constitution. Actually, what they did was they, they bought into the Iraq lie that they would be hailed as conquering heroes, and they're right. not. You tell yourself the story you want to hear, and then if it doesn't work out in true Republican fashion, you just pretend it did. I mean, that's what Donald Trump is. That's basically his act. I blow shit up. I pretend it's okay. I move on. Tell myself a story and move to the next thing. Fuck that up. Tell myself another story. Just keep, keep rinse and repeat because nobody... Nobody ever gets in your way to stop you, except now the resistance is sort of getting in the way, which is the point. That's exactly it. They have gotten accustomed to not being challenged because nobody gives a shit, nobody's interested, and uh, whatever. But they are being challenged, and they're being challenged because they're backing the fucking guy nobody likes. Let's, Let's repeat that again, and it probably will become a theme we're going to go through a lot. They're backing the guy nobody likes. Less than half of the people polled like this guy. He's a fucking train wreck and now they're being forced to confront it because their constituents who they've been able to ignore up to this point are not going to be ignored anymore. And that's why the resistance AJ is talking about is important. You have to be in their face all the time. They have to know that you are paying attention. And even if you can't catch everything they're doing, they have to know that you're paying enough attention that they're going to have check marks listed against them for all the shit that you do catch that goes against them. And when that number gets high enough, they're getting their asses voted out. Just to kind of put it in maybe more of a real numerical perspective here, once Donald Trump hits the consistent low 30s, I predict his party will abandon him in droves. Because at that point, they will see, well, shit, 70% of the country thinks this guy's a fucking lunatic. Just looking at this healthcare fiasco that we have going on now, this is a self-created, a Republican-generated crisis, okay? The reason that Obamacare doesn't work better than it does now, Republicans refuse to help fix any part of it. They called Obama a socialist for trying to pass it in the first place. They did everything they could to obstruct and block the insurance companies from being reined in. In case you don't remember what the world was like before 2008, before the ACA, it was a nightmare if you if you had a pre-existing condition. You're, you're just fucked. I mean, if you had cancer, pre-existing, you die. That's and, what happens. And here's the thing. We're talking about pre-existing conditions like being pregnant. Republicans, the time for you opposing the ACA and that's all you're doing It's over. You guys have the power now. If you want to repeal and replace Obamacare, great. Let's see a replacement. Because it's not just something you get to talk about and then do against the will of the people. You actually have to have a plan that makes sense and that's not fucking block grants or health savings accounts. You know what you get with block grants? You don't get any of the shit that you think you're going to get. That's what you get with block grants. No, you get a block of money to the states that's set and then once the money runs out, sorry, Charlie. That's a block grant. And again, this is a block grant organized and coordinated by your state level representation. Which and in our case is Terry Brandstad and, and company here in Iowa. So just rest easy tonight, Iowans, if we're yeah. looking at the block grant road. Think about that one. Terry Brandstad will be making decisions about your health care money. <laughs> After we refused the full Medicaid expansion and instead turned it over to a private company that then ran tens of millions of dollars in, in the red. And so, then, if he ever fucking goes to China, like he's supposed to as ambassador... Please, please just go. Just then, go. Then we're left with Kim Reynolds, who doesn't appear to actually know how to do anything, except nod when Branstead says something. So this is going to be a delightful little experience for all of us, particularly if we're relying on the block grant. The, the thing about what you said before, and I know we've mentioned it on more than one occasion here, Republicans, you've got literally all of it, 
which means you've got nobody to blame at this point. There, there are no excuses. None. Zero. Zilch. No, no excuse will be sufficient if you fuck up the healthcare system. There's nobody to blame. There's no one to turn to. There's no one to point fingers at. Least of all Barack Obama, whose health insurance program did insure 20 million additional people that weren't insured before. The other thing, and we've also mentioned this before, if the Republicans actually get their shit together and come up with a legitimate functional replacement for the ACA... I will be fucking happy as hell. Oh my God. I'm not going to do anything to try and sabotage that. If I can ensure that at least as many people who were insured before under ACA are going to be insured, fucking A. Great. Well, and I believe it was uh, Daryl Issa on Bill Maher's show the other night. He actually uttered the words, we need to look at what Canada's doing for our healthcare system. If we do not look at Canada and other countries and say, not everything they do is wrong, their health care cost half what ours cost. We've got to start looking at the cost drivers and work on it. Let's look to Canada, just like the Republicans always wanted. No, no, but the, okay. the fact is, around the world, probably including Sweden, there are, in fact, better <laughs> ideas. You know, in Wow. <laughs> it happens. I, I know, but Republicans never say that. Nope. There are better ideas around the world. What, don't you think we're exceptional here in America? I, I felt like a Chris Matthews shiver go up my leg. Yeah. You know, I, co I couldn't believe my ears. Republicans are actually talking about possibly looking at a single-payer system, which is something that Trump himself was on record as supporting in the past. And something that Democrats, including Hillary Clinton, have been working for for decades. Oh my god, the, the Democrats right now would fall over themselves to vote for anything that even looked like a Canadian style of healthcare system. And so would I for that matter. Yes. I'm not going to complain because it's Trump. Just no, do it. I don't give a shit who does it. Yeah. If if I get coverage, if my kids get coverage, if the people I know who can't get fucking coverage can get coverage, fuck yeah. I'm perfectly happy with that. I don't care what you... I don't care. I'll call it fucking Trump care. I don't give a shit. I really well, don't. And, and imagine imagine a world even for business, you know, just thinking of, you know, Trump's constituency, you know, large businesses. Imagine a world where tomorrow all of these CEOs and executives and entrepreneurs and, you know, people who are starting up, they, they now enter a system in which they are not personally responsible for insuring their employees because we have a Medicare for all system which covers it. To me, that is almost the definition of liberty. It's the idea that no longer does any citizen have to personally worry about their employment status to know whether or not they're going to be able to get help if they fucking find out they have cancer and they just lost their job. This should be obvious. This should be something that Americans can come together like the British came together after World War II and they uh, started the National Health Service. This should be our moment for that. And hopefully if Republicans are serious about you know, fixing Obamacare and not just trying to ram through some Paul Ryan, Ayn Rand uh, health savings account program, which, by the way, I love the protesters asking, how the fuck are we going to pay for the health savings accounts? Assuming that that's not the way they go and they do decide to go in the direction of conservative economic principles, which is single-payer systems tend to have better outcomes for less money than we do. If they go in that direction, we'll be fine. But we'll see if they have the long-sightedness to try that route. I'm going to guess no. And I don't I don't say that to be flippant. I, I, genu I genuinely don't think that it's in their, their political interests based on who's giving them money for that to happen. Because you can't do something that I think that even the hardest liberal would, would view as uh, not a capitalist principle in the United States and expect to get support from the people with the money. If I bought the notion that the GOP actually had real capitalist principles to begin with, I might be swayed by it. But I mean, I agree. Your, your pessimism is definitely well-founded. I mean, the Republican Party has shown itself to be an enemy of women's health care in particular and people's health care in general. If it were up to them, ladies and gentlemen, we would still be living in the pre-2008 era where your pre-existing condition would be a death sentence for you oh. if you were of a certain income level. Well, fuck, let's be honest. If it were entirely up to them and there were no checks and balances on anything, it'd be fucking Dickensian. And it sounds hyperbolic for me to say that. Uh, it's not really, no. But the easiest way to cut your expenses is to fuck the people working for you. And the fact that... All those industries that left the United States that everybody's bitching about and that Trump swears is going to come back, they all left because it was cheaper to get people who could die while making your shit and nobody cared. You think that if they couldn't do that here, they wouldn't? Again, sounds hyperbolic, but those regulations that they're talking about getting rid of, get rid of two for every one you add, those are the regulations that keep you from getting killed working on the line. Those are the things that keep you from dying because your food or your beverage is, is poisoned by shit in the factory. I don't have a lot of hope for the whole healthcare system under the Republicans simply for that reason. 
the evidence has shown us that they don't give a shit about you. Their only motivation ultimately is the bottom line and maintaining power in order to increase the bottom line. You can even argue there are Democrats like that too. I mean, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. AJ and I are not strictly partisan on this. The reason that we're focusing so much on the Republicans is because they're the ones with all the fucking power right now. Yeah, right. What I mean, what are we going to do? Talk about Democrats? I mean, basically the only thing they can do is try and slow down or obstruct the, the madness that's coming out of the Trump administration. But that's really about all they're good for. At this point, we can't count on the Democrats to do much for us. And I don't mean that to disparage them inherently. There's just not much they can do. So if you're looking at a straight political response in terms of of the democrats doing being able to do anything to protect you at best they inconvenience the republicans because they'll just come at it again as far as republicans are concerned here's the thing if you're willing to back trump you're willing to back anything let me tell you i'm a really smart guy nobody builds walls better than me believe me today i'm very proud of myself i am really proud i am really honored what a great honor it must be for you to honor me tonight. I think I do a really good job. You'll have the great pleasure of voting for the man that will easily go down as the greatest president in the history of the United States. Me, Donald John Trump. So to turn to a bit more of local news, we're just going to kind of keep on this theme of Trump's uh, dwindling popularity. There was an article that came out in the Washington Post on February 26th that was pretty interesting. The title of it is, These Iowans Voted for Trump. Many of them are already disappointed. And one of the key paragraphs that I picked out in here that was just sort of fascinating to me uh, is the following. Quote, Of the six swing states that were key to Trump's unexpected win in November, his margin of victory was the highest in Iowa, where he beat Clinton by nine percentage points. Yet at the dawn of his presidency, only 42% of Iowans approve of the job that he's doing and 49% disapprove, according to a Des Moines Register slash Mediacom Iowa poll this month. So nearly half of the state polled disapproves. Now, one of the interesting things about this article, and the reason I sort of brought it to AJ's attention, is because it actually highlights the impact of what's going on in Iowa Absolutely. On real people. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and out of this thing talking about some of the people here. I encourage you to go to the article and read it in its entirety because we're not gonna do it sufficient justice here. I'll have a link in the show notes so you can check it out. Washington Post is one of those that's nice enough to give you sample articles, but I would also encourage you to to subscribe as well. This article actually opens talking about a guy named Tom. I'm gonna call him Godat because I'm not sure how the hell to pronounce G-O-D-A-T. Maybe we'll just call him Tom. Yeah, I'll just call him Tom. It might be easier. He's a union electrician. And according to the article, he's always voted for Democrats. But he went with the lesser of two evils model for Clinton. And he's literally quoted as saying he's a little embarrassed about that. Now, it talks more about him, what he liked about Trump. And it was, quote, his pledge to make the country great again by ignoring lobbyists, challenging both political parties, and increasing the number of good-paying jobs End quote. Now, that's what he liked about Trump. You and I both know that was all bullshit. Okay? What Trump actually represents is something very different. And Tom mentions that. How surprised he was by the fucking chaos that came with the president's first month. He talks about feeling like Trump and his staff basically were just shooting from the hip, had no idea what they were doing. Which everybody talks about as if that's a great thing until you actually see it in action, and then you end up with shit like the Muslim ban, or Steve Bannon suddenly becoming the king of almost everything. My favorite quote in here is also a literal quote, which is, quote, it seems almost like a dictatorship at times. He's got a lot of controversial stuff going on, and rather than thinking it through, I'm afraid he's jumping into the frying pan with both feet. No. End quote. Which part feels like a dictatorship? The the media being the enemy of the American people, the religious bans, the increased security to take care of uh, immigrants, even though our net immigration has been zero for a couple of years. Which part of it feels like a dictatorship to you? I, I can't I can't follow. Yeah, that. I can't imagine. Now, further in the article, they talked to a guy named Kyler Sherbon, who quote describes himself as a progressive Republican who falls asleep watching Fox News each night. End quote. What a nightmare that must be. Yeah, I know. This is the part I want you to pay attention to. He trims trees for power companies, which is, as they indicated in the article, a full-time union job that pays him $60,000 a year 
and benefits. This is a guy without a college degree, but he has this kind of job because he has union representation. And he voted for the candidate most likely to try and dissolve the unions, who's actively going out of his way, even as we speak, to try and do as much damage to labor as possible. I hope he's happy with himself. Well, oddly enough, his first comment was that he doesn't care for how politicized unions have become. I don't know if he's aware of how unions first were created, but they were a political entity designed to protect workers. And he's willing to concede how grateful he is for the wages they've negotiated for him over the years. But now he's worried that what happened in the state of Iowa with the public employee union might have some impact on his private union. Again, did you not think that maybe that would be a thing? That, that's that's mystifying. How would you not know that the party that has been... I mean, since Reagan and the air traffic controllers, what do you think the people with the money, the employer class, are doing when they're buying the congressman and they're donating millions of dollars to super PACs? You think that's apolitical? It's almost a mystical double standard yes. that exists on the issue of unions, which I can't seem to get. It seems like everybody but the people who have to work for a living should get some form of representation and fair compensation. But if you're one of those people that are just trimming the trees or you're, you're putting up the power lines, you're being too political if you, if you want a union that you want to be a part of, that, that you want to be actually able to negotiate wages and benefits. That is too political for some people. Right. It, astounding. A astounding, given the reality of how money works in our political system. Now, Sherbon, not only does he work this, this union job, he and his dad also farm, because it's fucking Iowa, of course, right? Quote, he's really hurting us, even though everybody around here is conservative. When you cut off trade, that cuts off everything. Where do our crops go? They don't stay here. Unquote. So, he's acknowledging this is damaging to the other industry in which he is involved, which in this case is farming. But the article goes on to say, quote, Sherbon likes much of what Trump is doing, and he wishes protesters would give him a break, end quote. Now, he does, does he? I want to know, and if there are any Trump supporters listening, I really want to know this. What is it that you actually like about what he's doing? Honestly, what is it that you like? Because so far, the, the one positive thing I, I've seen from him so far, aside from making SNL relevant and funny again, is the, the one executive order or whatever the hell it was in which that basically involved lobbying and, and former politicians. The language of which sort of escapes me. But that's the best I've seen out of anything he's done. So tell me, Trump supporters, what is it, not about his rhetoric, what is it about his policies? What is it about what he's doing as president that you actually like? Yeah. Explain to me how an immigration crackdown helps the economy. What has his Muslim ban done to make us safer? What will his increase in defense spending at the expense of every other part of government do to help us? What is the actual silver lining here? Because it seems to be a mystery. I would actually maybe more use the word fantasy that we've got going here. People are just sort of imagining this other thing that Trump is doing, which, I mean, there's not really much evidence for, but apparently he's pleasing some people somehow. I have no idea how. And as it turns out, it looks like the majority of Iowans don't know how either, because no. he is now, he actually has a higher disapproval rating than approval rating in the state that he won by the largest margin that he needed to win to take the election. Up to this point, we've been talking about kind of rural areas in, in, in Iowa in this piece. They also go to Urbandale which is, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it's a, it's a western suburb of Des Moines. They happen to find a couple that is a, a mixed religion. One is a conservative, is self-described conservative Christian who's deeply opposed to abortion and usually backs Republicans. And her husband is Muslim. I'm glad they can figure out how to make that work. I don't know that I could do it, but I'm glad they can. But she didn't vote. She didn't vote because she thought both options were horrible options. Literally, quote, they're both horrible in my opinion, but Trump outweighed it just because of his racist stance on everything, end quote. But she decided not to vote. Yeah, well, I mean, look, when, when you draw these uh, uh, false similarities between two people, there, there is no similarity ethically between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. One is absolutely a corrupt monstrosity, and the other, Hillary Clinton, it was basically cleared of all of the so-called corruption that she was accused of. And despite multiple investigations, which Republicans, I mean, they threw themselves into investigating Benghazi and right. the emails and whatever else they could fucking get their hands on. They couldn't turn up shit, okay? Nothing. Now, 
as I mentioned. Yeah, it, it's sorry. It's it's just no, no, no. Pre- it, it's preposterous. I call it the both sides fallacy. Right. The fallacy of equivocation. Now, her husband, who is Syrian because he's not a citizen, can't vote. And I'm kind of curious how he feels about that after the Muslim ban popped up. I think it sort of mentions it in the article, and obviously you can, I don't want to devote a ton of time of it, but she talks about racism and uh, Islamophobia and all of that. And I find myself thinking, again, so how did you not vote? Your husband doesn't have a voice. You had a voice. You could have stood up for your husband and voted in opposition to Trump and chose not to vote. That is one of the things that bothers me the most about this election. It seems ridiculous given what the end result was, but that people, in some cases, suffered from the fallacy that AJ was talking about, which is, oh, they're both equally bad. I think that's bullshit. That's not a surprise. But even if you genuinely thought they were both equally bad, there has to be something in which you could look at one or the other. Pick any one thing more than the other, and you could have gone one way or the other, because you have to know, basically based on the elections that we've seen in the last couple of decades, you have to know it's going to be close, even if it shouldn't have been. Well, and if look, if you want one issue, here's my one issue. Hillary Clinton is the only major candidate that I have heard, actually, uh, ever. I'm not sure that I can't I can't know for certain she's the only one. She's the only one that I have heard and, and that I know directly went out of her way in the last campaign to talk about people with disabilities. She yes. gave an entire speech. The entire speech was completely about people with autism, people with disabilities, her programs, and what she wanted to do to make sure that they had work placement, et cetera, and so forth. Not even St. Bernie Sanders had a speech quite like that. So while Donald Trump... Trump is mocking a man with cerebral palsy and then lying about it. Right. Hillary Clinton is giving a speech, figuring out how we're going to get people with autism to have the dignity of work. So to me, if you want to come at me with this fucking both Republicans and Democrats are so corrupt and so evil thing, just fuck off. Yes. I don't have time for you. This last, this will be the last one in the article I'm going to talk about, which is which is Perry. Uh, again, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the state of Iowa, Perry is a city further west of Des Moines that has a very high Hispanic population because there are industries there still, like a meatpacking plant. As you may have guessed, once Trump came into office, a lot of people in Perry were terrified because they have no idea what the fuck's going to happen to them. And that includes even, like, legal residents. I mean, the article talks to a guy who owns a store there. He's a legal resident. He's working on becoming an actual citizen. He's here legally. He owns a store. But clearly some of his customers probably are not legal, and they're coming to him like, oh, my God, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Because they don't know. And there's a reason why they don't know, and that's because you have a president who a lot of people immediately respond, and I can guarantee almost all of them are white. I'm going to say that right now. They focus on the word illegal, okay? They're like, well, I don't have a problem with immigrants. I have a problem with illegal immigrants, except you really don't, because if you did, it wouldn't suddenly be a new thing for you to be concerned about, and if you like getting shipped cheap like you do, you're willing to support it. Because there's a reason why places in Iowa get raided and three quarters of their employment force gets dragged away by ICE. One of the other guys featured in here in this section on Perry is a retired county engineer. He's lived in Perry for 20 years now. So he's seen the increased immigrant population. I mean, it's unavoidable for him. He's quoted as saying, quote, these are good folks, quote, this place would not be functioning without the folks that have come here, end quote. Okay, now... With that in mind, I'm going to tell you who he voted for and why. Quote, I voted for the Supreme Court. I didn't want to vote for Trump. With Trump, you just hold your nose. End quote. Why? Why did he have to hold his nose and vote for Trump, even though he had to know that this incoming president would have a pretty hateful view of the people he views as important to his community? Fucking abortion. He's opposed to abortion. He made a decision about the lives of the people he interacts with. The people he has literally described as good folks. People who are the reason his city has an economy. And he picked fucking abortion. He's a 68-year-old retired county engineer. He doesn't give a shit about abortion. It has zero impact on him. The abortion issue, uh, to me, it, it's almost like watching one of those documentaries on apes when they're training people and, you know, they do something right and they get a little sugar pellet. That's basically what the abortion issue is yes. because it, it is an abstract issue that allows people to salve their conscience for voting for the horrible economic and national security policies that they tend to vote for and candidates that they tend to vote for. I have almost less patience for the abortion issue than I do for the both sides argument. Here's the thing about the abortion issue. Because abortion is one of those things I really want to spend a lot of time with on the show because it has virtually no resolution. Okay, we're not getting anywhere with it. You can choose between fully realized human beings who will actually experience genuine suffering 
or you can choose an abstract concept that actually has zero impact on your life or really anyone else's life. And you're going to choose the latter, really. Abortion it's, was made legal per the Supreme Court in 1973. It should be a settled issue. And from our perspective here at Swing State, it's a personal issue. It doesn't matter to us what somebody else's sexual decisions are, as long as they, they're making a rational decision. Because it doesn't impact me at all whether or not a woman I don't know has an abortion or not, or has a baby or not. That being said, the idea that somebody would use the issue to choose Trump over Hillary is another example of just the, the lack of critical thinking that we have in the country overall. Thankfully, the resistance movement seems to be coming to Iowa in both the form of town halls. David Young here in the Iowa's 3rd District was uh, met with a rowdy group the other day up in, I think it was Ankeny. Uh, also, Joni, Joni Ernst and Chuck Grassley both got an earful. And so keep it up, ladies and gentlemen. Keep on going. Keep on bugging them. And until next time... Organize, mobilize, protest, vote!